ministry team a hand. Music ministry band, thank you all so much. Amen. The word of the Lord today is found in the gospel according to St. Luke chapter number 2. Luke chapter number 2, the physician. It's amazing to read this text from his perspective. He was a doctor. A doctor expressed his birth in different ways than onlookers. He, he's, he's delivered babies before. So now he's discussing the immaculate conception. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. Here's the word of the Lord. Now in those days, a decree. Don't forget that word. Everybody say decree. It went out from Caesar to tax everybody in the empire. This was the first registration taken when the governor of Syria was there and everyone went to his own town to be registered. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee in Judea to the city of Bethlehem, which is the city of David because he was of the house and the family line of David. And he went to be registered with Mary who was promised in marriage to him and who was expecting a child. Just touch your name and say, I don't look like it, but I'm expecting. some things you don't think about until after you said it. <laughs> While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. She's, she's 14 years old. She gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in strips of cloth. Laid him in a manger. Not by choice, but by force, because there was no place for them in the end, which means she did look for some place to put them. It was unavailable. Some of y'all are looking for comfort. It's unavailable. The only thing that's available to you right now is a hard manger, because you got to give birth in a hard place. Hmm. <laughs> you, you thought it was going to be easy and you want the midwife and the doctor and the nurse and the, the epidural and the ice chips and the ice cream guy said nope I'm going to let you give birth by a nasty sheep in a hard stone that's used for animals to eat out of while you're not giving birth so another animal just ate out of it before you gave birth in it that's unsanitary. But I wonder if the germs are meant to build up the system. I wonder if God allowed the environment to happen because it would be the environment that would build the tenacity that the gift needs. For every person in this room today, and I know this to be true, you are in a season where you got to make a decision. This is a secret decision, though. Everybody doesn't know you got to make this decision. This is, this is not the one everybody knows. This is, this is on a low decision. You got to make this one, and this one could make you or break you. Mm -hmm. Whether do I stay at this job or do I leave this job? Do we stay in this house or do we move? Do I continue to try to pay for this car or do I just let them come get it? Who gonna say this? Come on now, we're gonna keep it real today. Do I kick them out of the house or do I let them stay? Do I beat them like they stole something or do I just talk to them? Got a decision to make. Whatever you do, don't sit still. Here's what I wanna talk about over the next few moments it's time to make a move. I want you to high five everybody on your way down to your seat and say, it's time for you to make a move. Hallelujah in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 
so yesterday, y'all, me and my wife and the girls were in the car, and uh, I had a photo shoot yesterday. I hate photo shoots because, I mean, you got to change all these clothes and, and everybody telling you what to do and sit up, put your chin down. I'm, Shut up. That's what you can do. We did a photo shoot. Not only did we do the photo shoot, but guess what? We was hungry. So my stomach is growling, and the babies is eating chips and asking Daddy, do we have any snacks? And so I take them over to the Cheesecake Factory. No, no, Grand Lux, pardon me. I took them to Grand Lux to eat. And um, they didn't even know that I had met their mother there. So I took them right to the place where I met their mother, and they were shocked. <laughs> they said, this where you met Mama? And, and Caitlin said, this is my favorite restaurant in the world. <laughs> and we looked at her and said, how you got a favorite? Well, she does. And we left, and we went to uh, the container store. Anybody go there? I like that place. All of my shoes are in plastic containers. I don't leave them in the shoe boxes because I need to see everything that I have. I put the red shoes with the red shoes and the black shoes with the black shoes and the blue shoes with the blue shoes and the brown shoes with the brown shoes and the gym shoes with the gym shoes and the dress shoes with the dress shoes. It is a beautiful sight to see. Because if you don't know what you have, you end up wearing the same thing over and over again. You, most people say, I don't have any clothes. No, you just got them all squished up. How do, you, how do I know you have too many clothes? You have to iron every time you put them on because everything is smashed up, right? So I got these containers, and I like them. And I got those containers, and as I went into the container store, there was, if you go to the one on Westheimer, it's two lines. It's two lines face Westheimer and two lines face Post Oak. And so most of the people come in the Westheimer line because it's right there, uh, right by the Galleria. So I pull in like everybody else, and I go in, and I get the containers, and I pick them up, and I look at the line, and it's 1,000 people in this one, and it's 2,000 people in that one. And have you ever seen a line so long that it made you not want what you went to the store for? <laughs> I start looking for a place immediately to sit this stuff down, and I'm one of the people in the stores. I put stuff back where it don't go, you know? Like, I put, I put the pack of chicken by the T-shirts because I'm not walking all the way back over there. <laughs> That'd be me. When y'all go over there and see Nutella next to the gold watch, that's me. And I'm looking for a place to put it, and so I was looking for a place to put it, and as I was going back to put it somewhere, I walked up on two lines that were completely open that everybody is in these lines and they're two lines over because, you know, as people, we follow each other. Like, if I, if I just start running right now, that would be like, you ain't going to ask why we're running. You're just going to be like, I ran because he ran. Have you ever noticed you go to the airport, everybody's in this line, and, and somebody has to say, uh, you can go that way too because we are, we're just creatures. We just follow each other. We're, we're like sheep. And all we have gone astray. So all of those sheep were in line. Me, I'm looking for another way. Get over here and find that there, there are two other lines with nobody in them. And so I go and I pay. And with my nice and kind self on my way out the door, I go and tell a couple. I whisper to them, trying to give them inside information. I say, hey. It's a line over there. Ain't nobody in it. And the wife was like, oh, my God, thank you so much. She got the cart, and she was getting ready to go. And the husband grabbed it and said, no, we ain't going nowhere. He said, we're going to stay right here. Whatever, man. He said, we're going to stay right here because we've been in this line so long, we might as well wait it out. Then I realized that that's most of us, that we are so dedicated to our decision that we're not open for new information. That most people are so dedicated to their choice 
that even in the face of a more excellent way, they'd rather stay in the line they're in because they picked it. And sometimes God will send you somebody that'll show you another way where you don't have to wait. And just because you've been waiting doesn't mean you have to finish the wait. His pride got in the way, and he stayed dedicated to his initial decision. And he could have saved 10 minutes had he listened to me, but he was dedicated to his choice. And the worst relationship you can ever be in is with your opinion. It is the hardest relationship to get out of because your opinion will marry you and not give you a divorce. Your opinion will stay in your life and follow you everywhere you go. If you leave your opinion, it'll follow you. If you move, it'll follow you. The opinion always finds a way to move in the same house you live in. The most difficult relationship that anybody in this room is in is not with your spouse, it is with yourself. For some of us cannot divorce ourselves from our decisions and we think because we picked it that it is right but let me tell you sometimes you can pick a thing that was good at the time and then new information comes and then you got to make another decision it's time to make a move you are in the most critical season of your life this world is crazy things are going up and down and nobody knows for sure where it's going to end up but you do know that there is a protection for the righteous and that God has special things opportunities that we have been engrafted into although we are not the chosen generation we are now a royal priesthood in other words, you are not a Jew, so you are not according to the original diaspora. But what it does mean that when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that means now you have the same fringe benefits as those who accepted, or excuse me, who were born of him. And now we have been engrafted. Everybody say engrafted. We have now been engrafted into the lineage of Christ, and now we have access to everything that the chosen generation has access to, which means sometimes we've got to be ambidextrous in our decisions. Sometimes we've got to go with what we feel, and sometimes we've got to go with what he said. Sometimes God will stand back to see what you're going to do, and then after you pick your direction, he'll come right in right when you get to the door of your decision and then say, I want you to take a left. He'll then say, go to a place called there, and you'll say, God, what's there? And God said, I'll tell you you're there when you get there. Sometimes God will allow you to wander and walk and be confused and, and, and making decisions and, and wondering what it's going to be without any voice. Do you know that God did not speak to Moses from the age of 40 all the way to 80? Sometimes God will let you walk around for 40 days with no word. And you're saying, God, if you want me to do this, say something. If you want me to do that, say something. God, give me a sign. And God says, I'm not going to give you a sign. I'll just be a sign. And when you get there, I'll show up. God says, you're waiting on me to give you directions. I'm waiting on you to make a decision. I'm not telling you where to go, but I will make wherever you go the place you should have been. Do you know that God has enough power to make where you end up the place that he wanted you to go? God says, go there. Somebody say, go there. And I don't know who I'm talking to, but this is your there season. This is your time to get up and make a move. This is your time to leave everybody behind that is not going in the same direction as you. This is the time to decide whether you're going to be friends with them for the next 20 years or are you going to end it in the next 20 days. This is the time for you to start changing your phone number. This is the time for you to get another handle on social media. This is the time for you to wonder and, and figure out who's going to be in your your life for this next season because when you get there you don't want their people you got to make a move and you got to make it now are you going to stay on that job or are you going to leave are you going to put the application in or are you going to sit there and just wait on them to fire you is the relation you, you need to be out the relationship and you know it you just want them to break up with you so what you do is you just act crazy and you be telling girl, girl, I've been treating him so mean, he got to give up sooner or later. <laughs> Make a decision. Everybody say pick. pick. Where do you stand? Who's on the Lord's side? You got to make a decision. They made a choice. They got up and said, I'm on the move. We're going to go to Bethlehem 
because Caesar has called for a census. And Caesar said that every male Jew has to go to the place of his origin and his birth. Now watch this. The danger of this season that we're in, and we're talking about the Christmas season because this is a season of tradition. People don't normally make moves in this season. We just contemplate the same stuff we did last year, right? Right? You're going you're gonna to make a New Year's resolution, and you're going to say the same things. I'm going to go to the gym, and I'm going to work out, and I'm going to be a vegan, and I'm going to be a vegetarian. No, you ain't. Listen, look at me. No, you're not. You're going to do it for six days, maybe 16, but after that, you're going to get some bacon. I already know because I'm going to do it. Some of you have already went and got the tree and they cut it down and it's eight feet like you wanted. Or some of you, like me, went up in the attic and got the cardboard box and brought the trees downstairs. How many of y'all like real trees? How many of y'all like the fake ones? Them real ones be leaving needles everywhere, don't they? I go back and forth. Sometimes I do a real one, sometimes I don't know. And, and my, my, my mother said it to me today. She knows my mood changes about this time of year. She asked me for some my mama's birthday. My mother be 64 tomorrow. She'll be 64 tomorrow. And she said, she said, I got something to ask you, but I ask you tomorrow when you're putting up the Christmas tree because I know you'll be in a good mood. <laughs> so I might go buy one. So I had to put it up. But she, she said that to me, and it made me think about the holiday and the tradition and how the same story is going to be told in the pulpit. Oh, he was born of a virgin named Mary, wrapped in swaddled and clothed, laid in manger, and everybody's going to be singing Noel and Jingle Bells, and everybody's going to be happy, and, and, and everybody's going to be excited, and it's going to be the same thing, and you're going to buy the same people's stuff that don't deserve it, spend money you don't have, and think that you got to match them because they gave you a gift, and all of a sudden you got to give them a gift. And here you are spending money you don't have to buy somebody a gift because they bought you a gift. I I suggest this year that when people buy you a gift and you don't have money to buy them one, I suggest you go to them and say, this doesn't mean you get one in return. So either I return this or you're just going to have to wait on me the next year. Do I have a church in here? Same thing's going to go over. Y'all going to cook the same stuff. You're going to get a ham. You're going to put them little black things in it and put some uh, pineapples on top of it and put the little red sauce on it. And you're going to get some, some dressing and you're going to get potato salad and deviled eggs and y'all going to eat the same food and, 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 and get the same ugly sweaters and everything's going to be the same. And you're going to put that same thing on the bottom of the Christmas tree that you put on there last year. You already labeled it. It's in a plastic bin somewhere in the garage or upstairs right now. And you're going to get it. You're going to bring them same ugly placemats down from that attic and put them on that table. You should got rid of them placemats 17 years ago. They still look, everybody's going to watch the Christmas story 1,000 times. You're going to watch Home Alone 5 million times. You're going to sit in front. You're going to do the same thing. You're going to call the same person talking about a broccoli casserole. You're going to call the same person talking about a sweet potato pie. Mm, her cakes is good. Y'all ain't never had a cake till you had a cake. It's the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over. The same people going to bring the same dish. The girl that did the, the green beans, she's going to bring them again this year. And the girl who did the sweet potato, she's going to bring it in. It's going to be the same thing. Everybody know what to expect. And the one that can't cook, she's going to wash the dishes. You can always tell the one that can't cook, they got a broom in their hand talking about, I'm just going to do my part, and I'm going to do my part. I... <laughs> Everybody says it's time to make a move. The Bible says in Luke chapter 2, in those days a, de a decree went out, and Caesar Augustus said there had to be a census taken of the whole world. Now watch this. The Greek word for decree, everybody say decree. The Greek word for decree is dogma, D-O-G-M-A, dogma. That is an amazing word because the word dogma is one of the only words that is spelled and pronounced the same in English and in Greek. So here you got the word dogma. It means the same thing in English and in Greek. It is a set of religious beliefs that one ascribes to. And watch this. It is the opinion of one in authority. So in actuality, what the scripture is actually saying is that Caesar used his authority to give them his opinion. Now, I'm getting ready to help somebody in here right now because in this next season of your life, in order for you to make a move, you're going to have to get yourself out of relationships where people use their authority to make you think like them oh God help me in this place the most dangerous relationship for you in 2018 is going to be the relationship where you don't use your mind 
Oh, God. The most dangerous position for you to be in right now is where you don't use your mind. Some of you all have a job right now. You go to that job tomorrow, you're going to clock in, you're going to sit in the same space, you're going to sit in the same cubicle, you're going to warm the coffee up at the same pot, you're going to get on the computer and do nothing like you did last week, you're going to do nothing. Your job doesn't require you to think, you're on autopilot. You're just there to get a check. And the reason why you're unfulfilled and the reason why you're not happy, even with a paycheck coming in, is because you are in an environment where you don't use your head and whenever you don't use your head you become unhappy because all happiness comes from the inside and not the outside when you are looking for happiness to come in from the outside it is short-lived but when it comes from the inside it is not called happiness it's called joy and that's why the songwriter says this joy that I have the world didn't give it and the world can't take it away touch your neighbor say use your mind don't have a job where you don't use your mind. Some of you are going to get in a car tomorrow and you're going to drive and you're going to end up at your house and you're not even going to recognize that you turn left or turn right. You're just going to arrive and you're going to look up and recognize that you're home because you would have text messages all the way there not putting any thought into the journey and whenever you are in a relationship where your perspective is not appreciated, anybody who does not appreciate your presence should earn your absence. I want you in this next season of your life to make sure you are not around people who don't care what you think. Lord, help me in this church today. Touch your name and say, do you care what I think? Because if you don't, I got to change seats. You need to be around people who want to know what you think. Even Jesus went to his disciples and said, who do men say that I am? You're around people who don't care about what you think? You're in the wrong circle. You shouldn't date anybody who don't care what you wear. I don't care what you wear. No, that, they, they're not interested. Anybody who's interested in you cares what you wear. They care how long your nails are. They care how long your hair is. They don't mind it being shoulder length. And they don't mind it being back length, but they don't want you tripping over it. Y'all gonna say amen or say ouch. Uh, when a woman is into you, she cares how thick your beard is or how thin it is or, 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 or y'all do I have any real ladies in here today she, she cares she, and, and I can always tell when a brother got a new woman in his life his whole wardrobe changes you all you gotta do is pay attention to him before he met her clothes was all baggy and t-shirt was all loose up here she said uh uh baby if you're gonna be with me you got to come with it and so she go get him dressed up and he start tucking his pants and his boots and all of a sudden he fly and he got a belt on because he's with somebody who cares You got to get out of these relationships that you can be in and not think. Well, this is good news for 2018 for anybody who wants to do it. It's time to make a move when people use their authority to force their opinion on you. And what I am saying that one of the key indicators that you are in the wrong place or with the wrong person is that your perspective is no longer appreciated. That you got to be in a place where somebody wants to know, what do you think? you got a job nobody ever comes to your office and say what do you think about this you probably need to move on you, you got to be able to use your head everybody say use your head okay if you don't you need a scripture if a man is going to be changed it must be by the renewing of his opinion no if a man is going to be changed it must be by the renewing of his ego no if a man is going to be changed it has to be by the renewing of his bank account no, if a man is going to be changed, it starts in the psychological database that your mind is the key to every locked door. Your mind is the key to every opportunity. Your mind is the key to everything that you don't think you have access to. That's why the Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, in his head, so is he. The reason why you don't have it is because you don't think you can have it. I dare you over the next six seconds just to start thinking crazy stuff and start believing crazy stuff and watch won't God give you what you see. This church that we're in right now, and there's only a few people he can tell you, and I know the Stroders there sitting right there, they were with me with the first church that I started in Indiana, and they can tell you that 15 years ago when I drew a building on paper, I drew this exact building before I ever saw it. You remember that, Mama? We had blueprints 
that if I would have brought you the blueprints from 15 years ago, it was this building, and I had never been in Houston, and I had never saw this building before. But what I'm trying to tell you that your mind is so powerful that you can conceive a thing, and God made somebody else build what I thought. Y'all not here with me today. I'm decreeing and declaring, if you'll start using your mind, if you'll use your mind, God will use the person who got the money. And he'll take the person that got the money and build what's in your head. Lord, help me in this place. Everybody's not in the same season. So you get it in your head, and you think, well, I can't afford it, so ain't no sense of dreaming. No, wrong. Dream it. God's got somebody somewhere who will build it until you are ready for it. God's got somebody somewhere who will make it happen until you arrive. God's got somebody somewhere who will build what's in your head if you have the courage to use it. This thing right here, do you know they can't even build computers that can keep up with it? Do you know that the, the data that your brain can keep outweighs all of the servers in the whole world? That anything you learn, you can remember. That anything you intake. And did you not know when you're asleep, you're still thinking? Have you ever had a song on your head that you just walking around wondering, like, why am I singing that song? It's because subconsciously you heard it somewhere, and then it came to the frontal cortex of your mind, and you started to sing it. Why? Because your head is always working. The problem is, is when you're not always working it. Caesar wanted their heads not to work because whenever you have somebody who has a brain and won't use it, you can make a slave. I'm trying to show you how to be free in 2018, how to stop walking around here like a zombie, go to work at 8, get off at 5, go home, boil noodles, <laughs> get up, do it again, go to work, come home, talk to the kids, Act like you're going to help them with the homework. Get frustrated because you don't understand what they're doing. <laughs> Fix them something quick to eat. Everybody take a bath. Everybody go to bed. Get up. Do it again. Work, home, sleep. Work, home, sleep. Work, home, sleep. You do that long enough, you'll die with all of your vision inside of you. Or you'll be too old to have the energy to bring it out. You got all of that in you, and all you're going to do is go to work and come home. You got all of that in you, and all you're going to do is use a little small portion of your brain to make somebody else's come, dream come true. That's called a job. And not find one hour a day to get what's inside of you out. You've got a Caesar in your life. Maybe it's your boss. Maybe you're your own taskmaster, but everybody in here, you've got something that's keeping you from using your head. And I'm here to tell you today, if you don't hear anything else I said, today it's time to make a move. Would you be mad if you had two cars? Let me ask you this. If you had two cars, one was a Toyota, one was a Lamborghini, and the Toyota had gas in it, which one would you get in? See, how you can have a high-performance car with no fuel, it's rendered useless. And you've got a Ferrari of a dream with a Toyota mentality. And you're feeding your Toyota, and you won't fuel your Lamborghini. You were made to do it. You were made to do it. You were created to do it. You were born to do it. You were bred to do it. You've got the power to do it. You've got the strength to do it. You've got people praying for you for you to do it. But you won't do it because you've got a Caesar that has given you the opinion, oh, I can't do it. I don't have the degree. You know, people do stuff without degrees every day. You understand that, right? I don't have the money. Neither did the people who did it. 
It's amazing that if you ever start, the money will find you. I'm not trying to shout you today. We did that early. I'm trying to get you to a place where you understand that this is the time and the season for you to make a move. Everybody say make a move. Each Jew had to go back to his hometown. And when he got there, he had to fill out a sheet of paper. And when he got there, the, 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 the Caesar said, all right, I need four things from you. He says, I want you to write your name on it. Everybody say name. He said, after that, I want you to, work with, I want you to write down where you work. Somebody say work. work. Then he says, I want you to write down how much property you have. Because in those days, property was their money. It was their currency. So he said, I want you to write down how much property you have. And after you do that, I want you to write down the name of all of your children. Why in the world does he need that information? And then the Lord showed me that in this next season of your life, these are the four areas that the devil is going to attack you in. Write this down. The first area the devil is going to attack you in in, 20, 000, in 2018, he's going to attack you in the area of your reputation. The second place he's going to attack you is on your occupation. The third place he's going to attack you is in the area of your compensation. And then lastly, if he can't get you with reputation, occupation, and compensation, children, he's going to get you in your generation. Oh, you better write that down right now. Because the best way to fight the devil is to know which area he's coming from. First thing he's going to do is fight your reputation. Everybody say reputation. Proverbs 22 and 1 says a good, man, a, a good name is to be esteemed more than silver and gold. Do you know how important your name is? That's why the devil's going to try to mess up your name. The devil's going to try to mess up your name. I'm talking to some parent right now. There, there's, there is some chatter among the teachers right now talking about your child. And your child is going to have struggles going from place to place because their name is going to precede them. I'm talking to some of y'all right now at your job. People are talking about you and, 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 and demeaning you and, and, and they're trying to tear down your name. But I'm going to tell you that we serve a God that will hide you in a secret place. And in this next season of your life, God told me to tell you he's about to make your name great before men. Touch your name and say God's about to make make my name great. As a matter of fact, if I had 500 people who would stand up and just start shouting your name and start shouting what you want God to attach to your name, come on, call out your name, your last name, so that this blessing could cover your children and your children's children. Come on, get your name in the atmosphere. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Come on, call out that name and assign riches and wealth to it. Call out that name and start attaching things to it, that everywhere you go that you will be blessed. As a matter of fact, you might not even be related to the Johnsons on the other side of town, but by the time God finished blessing this set of Johnsons, he's going to bless that set. You may not even be related to the Hendersons in Alabama, but every Henderson is going to be blessed. I wish somebody would open up your mouth and begin to say, God, protect my reputation. Don't let what they say about me destroy me. Somebody say the devil's coming after my name. Do you know the best way to help your reputation? Go on and tell everybody how crazy you is up front. You walking around here trying to act like you ain't never done nothing, ain't never been nowhere, and ain't never done nothing wrong. Matter of fact, I just want you to just come out, and I know y'all gonna get mad, but I'm gonna tell you, say, yep, I drunk it, I smoked it, I slept with him, I didn't do it once, I did it twice, I wanted to do it three times, but I ran out of gas. If I had somebody here, just go ahead on and just tell the truth, because if you get it out, it ain't news. I wish I had somebody in here tell them, I'm tore up from the flow up, I got an attitude, I will smack you if you say something to me. I tried to stop cussing last year, it didn't work. I got a few cuss words I still put in there in the name of Jesus. Y'all in church today, y'all getting on my nerve. I'm about to go home. Y'all sitting around here acting like you ain't never done nothing wrong. Touch your name and say, get it out. Yeah. Been to jail three times for stealing blue jeans. Just tell it. Because the devil is coming after your reputation, and the one he can harm is the one that is the opposite of the picture you painted for us. You want to rock around here talking about you talking tongues, and, and you're holy, and, and everybody need to be living right, and then you be living wrong. Now we're looking at you sideways. Touch your name and say, I ain't what I want to be, but I ain't what I should be either. Lord, help me. I'm going to talk to people on this side. Because y'all y'all with me, but they tripping. I said, tell your neighbor, I ain't what I want to be. And I ain't what I should be. But here's why I'm getting ready to shout. I ain't what I used to be. Do I have anybody here that made some moves? Do I have anybody who has made some progress? 
I'm not where I want to be, but I ain't where I used to be. Slap your neighbor and say, God's still working on me. I might slip up, but he's still working on me. I might fall back and backslide, but he's working on me. If I've got somebody in here God is working on, make some noise in this place today. God's about to do something with your name. Your name is going to mean something. By the time you finish, people are going to be naming their children after you. By the time you finish, they're going to have to name a bridge after you. By the time you finish, they're going to have to name a street after you. By the time you're finished, there will be a library in your name. Somebody say, I received that. By the time you finish, your, grand, your great-grandchildren are going to go to the school named after you. He's going to make your name great. He's going to make your name great. They're going to say, they're going to hear that name. They say, I heard that name somewhere before. Your name going to be synonymous with money. Oh, Lord, help me. You know, when you hear the name Ford and Rockefeller and shout out some last names to me. What's your name out there? They're going to start saying that name. That's going to mean something. That's going to mean something. I hear banks in your name, credit unions in your name. Y'all ain't saying nothing. 501c3s in your name. Some of y'all gonna open management groups in your name. Some of y'all gonna open up schools in your name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow and every tongue must confess. At the name of whoever you are, the city officials and, and the mayors and the governors are gonna have to bow because God's gonna give you so much influence. The devil's coming after your name. So he's coming after your reputation. But God ain't going to let it work. If he can't get you at your reputation, he's going to try to get you at your occupation. It's going to be somebody at that job. Have you ever had somebody at the job and you'd be like, you know what, if I, didn't, if I wasn't going to lose my job. Just be honest with me, because I told y'all, don't, don't fake now. How many are, it, have you ever had somebody at your job, you said, if, you know what, Lord... Either they're going to have to go or I'm going to have to go because they don't want this work. They don't even know what I'm capable of and ain't that I can fight. I'm just crazy. I, got, I just got all this pent-up anger inside of me that if, 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 if they just catch me on the wrong day, the Bible says a man that doesn't work don't eat. So the devil's trying to mess with your bread, literally. But here's the deal. For some of y'all, you need to get fired. Because God been telling you to start your own business for the last three years, and you just comfortable getting the check. You can't leave because you get benefits. You're comfortable. I don't know about you. I, I'm allergic to a job. I know this to be true. I had three of them in my life. I got fired twice and I quit once. God don't want me to work for nobody. And there's some of you all in here right now going to job. There's nothing wrong with it. But if you've been called to something greater and you stay where you are, see, failure is not accomplishing a goal. Failure is having a goal and not pursuing it. Do you know that I have failed nine times for every one time that I won? But God makes the one win so big <laughs> that it makes the nine losses palatable. If you've been called to greater and you stay at good, it's a sin. What is a sin by definition? Anything that displeases God. It displeases God for you to stay average when you've been called to be great. You were not created to have a job. You were created to create jobs. That's why you're never happy on the jobs you have. And God's trying to force you out, and you just comfortable. So the devil attacks you on your work. And there's somebody right now, you, you, every time you see them, you just be like, Lord, mm. 
He ever has some some just no so no good to say you just don't say it, just be like, mm. I speak a spirit of entrepreneurialism in this room. Oh, I decree it. Somebody say, I decree it. So you got to start decreeing and declaring things. You got to start speaking those things that are not as though they were, and you got to believe it if you can't see it. You got to trust it when you can't trace it. You got to pray for it when you can't perceive it. You got to believe it when you cannot even bear it. And you got to ask God, God, if you'll do what you did to the two fish and five loaves, would you break it and bless it? And I told him on, on, on Thursday something that you need to know today, that Jesus did not feed the 5,000. Everybody keeps saying Jesus fed the 5,000, not including the women and the children. No, he did not. The Bible says that they found the fish and the loaves, and they brought it to Jesus. And the Bible says that Jesus blessed it, and then he broke it, and then he gave it to the disciples, and then the disciples fed the people. Because what the Word of God wants you to know is God will do the breaking and the, and the, and the blessing, but you got to do the distributing. And so God is going to put it in your hands so not only can you bless the women, you can also bless the children. And not just bless the children, but bless the men. I came to tell you that God is getting ready to make you a distribution center. That God is getting ready to download blessings and prosperity into your hands. And then he's going to use you to give it out. Somebody shout, I need to be blessed. Not to brag, but to be a blessing. There's some people that won't be blessed until you do it. They're in your heart. They're in nobody else's heart. They're in your heart, so God's got to get it in your hands to get it in their hands because they're in your heart. He's coming after your reputation and occupation. Third, your compensation. The devil's getting ready to mess with your money. He already started, ain't he? How many of y'all, he, he already started? Oh, Lord, these bills won't go nowhere, will they? Every time I go to the mailbox, somebody wants something. How many of y'all like paying bills? You like them? I can't get no consensus on the bills, Jesus. Your money is going to be under attack because money is the way God gauges your heart. See, tithing ain't about money, it's about the heart. So what the devil will do is he will create these scenarios where you spend your money on other things and then when it comes time to make it a seed, it's unavailable. <laughs> you ain't got to agree with it, but it's so true. He wants you to spend your money because if you spend it, it's worth a dollar. If you seed it, it's infinite. So the reason why most people don't have enough money it's because they spend it. They don't seed it. That God could take 10% of a dollar and take a dime and make it a million as a seed. But if you spend the dime, you only get 10% or 10 cents, I should say, worth of merchandise. So he attacks your money. How does he attack it? Making sure you can't tithe with it. How does he attack it? Okay, I'm a, am I going to get my engine fixed or am I going to tithe? It just makes sense to get my engine fixed. That makes sense physically, but it doesn't make sense spiritually. That when you see the money, see, when you spend it, you get the engine fixed. When you see it, you could get a car dealership. I want you to understand that the devil is after your money and there is an attack coming and you need to stop spending so much and you need to put it back. I know there's some things you want to buy. I know there's some things you want to buy and you think you deserve it because you've been waiting all year for it and you've been saving up for it. God says, not yet. I know you want a new couch. But what's wrong with the one you got other than it's old? So what? Everything else in there old too. Something being old does not mean it needs to be replaced. Not in a season where you're trying to build and go to the next level. Old is not an option when you're trying to build. Old is an option after you've already arrived. If that car still running, keep driving it. I don't care that your girlfriend got a new car. You ain't got to keep up with her because she got a new car, but she can't tell you. That's why she drink water every time y'all go out to eat because she can't afford no pop. 
Talking about I'm on a diet. No, baby, you broke. You ain't on no diet. I just want water and bread sticks and a salad. I'm on a diet. No, you ain't. You can't afford no steak. Everybody say, do something right with your money. Man, this is the best part of the sermon. Some of y'all are missing it right now. You might not be able to get your hair done every week. You might have to go to every other week. You might not be able to get your nails done every Friday. Sister said, oh, Jesus, what kind of pressure is this, God? You might just have some gaps in there for a little bit. Get a touch-up. I mean, you got to get a full set. I'm just saying, it's a whole lot of things you can do because you're trying to build. And what good would it be for you to arrive at an opportunity with nails and feet and no money? Now you look good, but you can't afford to buy in. Fellas. Cars. Rims. And you're too grown for PlayStations. Now, I ain't trying to get nobody business. You ain't got no business being 50 with a PlayStation 4. The age of playing games has got to be somewhat down here. You should not be beating your son in Madden. A wise man provides for his children's children. You got to have some money in the bank. That's the problem with our generation. We, we live rich and die poor. And then when we die, somebody's got to bury us. Why would somebody have to bury you and you drove the Escalade when you were alive? What sense does that make? Y'all ain't got to say, man, I ain't going nowhere. I'm trying to help you to survive the attack. How many years do you want to be broke? Over spending habits, not economics. See, this kind of sermon, this kind of sermon right here, this make people wish church was over a little earlier. They be like, I ain't come for this. I did not come for this. Y'all. Yeah. This ain't for the ones who ain't come for it. This is for the ones who did. So touch your name and say, I came for this. I came for this. I came for this. I came to get right. I came to get my life together. I came because I am not going to repeat this year. I am not going to have the same kind of next year that I had past year. My year of elevation is here, and I'm going all the way up. I'm going all the way up. God says, you're going to go from the borrower to the lender. And I'm not guaranteeing you're going to be rich. I'm guaranteeing you that you're going to be financially, fiscally responsible. Robbing Peter to pay Paul, that's over with. Just touch on him, that's over with, that's over with. I might not be able to buy what I want, but I'm not going to be crying about no $200 bill. And I'm not doing that no more. When I go to the grocery store, I'm not going to be up there picking time. I put that back, put that back. Just get whatever you want. Just put it in there. I'm not going to be going to the gas station talking about. <laughs> oh, just <laughs> let it fill up and come back when, you, when it's done. Let me get 20 on fire. No. Let it go till it's full. You put 20 in there, you're going to be back before you get home. Are y'all listening to me? Reputation. Occupation. Compensation. If he can't get you there, generation. He's coming after your children. 
Some of y'all got grown kids. They are not exempt. A grown child can get addicted to drugs. When we think about this children's stuff, we're always thinking about the kids in school. Some of y'all got kids in your 30s and 40s. All of a sudden, your 40-year-old child goes through a divorce and it rocks their world. What do you do when you prayed against it and you fasted for it? And what do you do when a child that you raised and you thought they were on their way and all of a sudden they get a bad, bad diagnosis and the disease doesn't even run in the family, this is the first time you've ever seen it. What do you do? Joshua said in Joshua 24 and 15, he said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I'm going to finish on this. I can't wait till you parents get back in control of your house. We have lost control of a whole generation. They do what they want to do, when they want to do it, and how they want to do it. And some of y'all so scared, you're talking about, well, it's just a new generation. It could be a new generation, but it could be an old method. I'll tell you that right now. The Bible says, spoil the, <laughs> spare the rod, spoil the child. And I know I have some parents in here to tell your kids, I don't care how big you is, I will climb up you and chop you down to size. They talking about, the, you, I'm taller than you now, mama. That's good, because the bigger they are, the harder they fall. You got to get back in control of your house. Your children need a bedtime. You can't even have a boyfriend. He's trying to talk to you at 11 o'clock. All he hear in the background is, ah, ah, ah. He ought to be in the bed somewhere. He, you talking to your son the whole time you're on the phone with him. Sit down, Shantae. Supposed to be asleep. Do you know how the devil is attacking us and to single women who have sons? You got to let them grow up. You have no business taking a shower with your eight-year-old. I don't care how convenient it is. Y'all forgive me for us, but I got a young church. I got to deal with them like this. Y'all, I know this ain't how church used to be. I've been in church my whole life, but this is, they crazy. Y'all don't even know what I deal with. I'm telling you, you might think I'm crazy, but it's all of us. We, I'm dealing with us together. Y'all forgive me. Y'all gonna come back on another Sunday? Okay, thank you. <laughs> I love y'all so much. Appreciate you. These people ain't but 32 and 33 years old. You got to ask them. And, and most of us didn't have no father, no mother. No, they didn't even tell us this stuff. So the reason why they're clapping is because they are hurting and feel helped at the same time because they're thinking in their mind, I wish somebody would have told me this before I... But I'm going to tell you right now, we're going to redeem the time. We're going to redeem the time. God's going to give you everything that you thought you needed and everything that the devil took from you. You're going to get it back. Touch your, touch your neighbor and say, you're going to get it back. Single mothers, you got to let these boys grow up. Stop babying them. Because you're going to give a grown woman a baby. And then she's going to have two, the one she married and the one she had. And you married couples, get these big kids out of your bed. Time out, he's scared of the dark. Well, he just won't have to get over it. He better pray to the Lord, give him light, because ain't nowhere in the world. See, and, and see, some of y'all women, y'all keep your, your sons in their bed because you, you know that's a way to get over the request. In about 15 minutes, come downstairs and say you scared. Don't make me. I come out there and fight all of y'all. Just when you hear the TV go off, come downstairs. Him downstairs. <laughs> Convenience will cripple a child. He's coming after your children and is using you as the weapon. You, 
cussing in front of them, wonder why they cussing the teacher out. I'm grown, and you ought to be grown enough to know that kids repeat what they hear. I don't even play crazy music around my children. I don't care what movie I'm watching. Caitlin, walk in the room, change the channel. You don't get to keep watching it because they walk in your room, make a decision, either kick them out or change the channel. No wonder they're having nightmares. They're watching your movies. And stop making your children your friends. And right now I'm talking to, to parents who have older children who have been hurt, and you start telling your daughters about the pain that their father caused you. That ain't their business. You keep that to yourself. Find your girlfriend and tell her. And if you ain't got one that'll keep her mouth closed, tell yourself. He's attacking our children and he's using us as the weapon. And we've lost a whole generation. And we've got 25 and 35 year old zombies walking around here with no identity, no plan, nowhere to go, nothing to do. They won't pray, they won't go to church, they won't do nothing. They don't have any answers. No prayer life, no knowledge of the scripture. Can't keep a relationship. No morals, no values, just alive. And we're being taxed by Caesar. And we've lost a generation. But thanks be to God. That we serve a God not just of a second chance, but of another chance. And like Caesar did in those days, I decree and I declare that God's getting ready to bless your occupation, your reputation, your generation, and your compensation. And I'm telling you right now, your money is about to get right, your family is about to get right, your mind is about to get right, your house is about to get in order. I wish somebody right now would begin to give God about 30 seconds of praise that all things are getting ready to work together for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Somebody begin to worship God in this place today. Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That word serve is the Hebrew word abad, which means to worship. It is the same worship that the woman at the well had when she met Jesus, when she was asking, where should we worship? And Jesus says, the day will come where you Jews would not worship on this mountain or any other mountain. What God was trying to tell them is what I'm trying to tell you, that worship is portable. In other words, wherever you go, you ought to be able to worship. Whatever you're in, you ought to be worshiped. Slap somebody a high five and say, my worship is portable. Whether I'm in season or out of season, I still got to worship. Whether I'm in the field or whether I'm in the house, I've got to worship. Whether I've got money in my pocket or whether I'm trying to get a loan, I've got to worship. Do I have somebody in here who will bless the Lord with me? Let us exalt his name together over the next 30 seconds. I don't care what's going on in your life. Worship God that a move is about to come in your direction. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit. Stand to your feet. It is time to make a move. And you know what? When it's time to make a move, it's not comfortable. I did not come today to entertain you or to make you feel good. I came to tell you to get off of your butt and get moving. That every successful person you admire started with what you had, two eyes, two ears, one nose, one mouth. In fact, some of the ones who were succeeding had less than you. Some of them were blind. Some of them were, were missing extremities. Some of them succeeded in wheelchairs and on crutches. You got all of your faculties. What is your excuse? Get up and make a move because the baby will not be born until you get to Bethlehem. God use Caesar's plan to get Mary and Joseph in position. 
He used the taxation system for the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy that the Savior had to be born in Bethlehem. They would have never went to Bethlehem any other way. God told me to tell you, he let it happen because you